Hi, uh, I'm Nick. I'm a data scientist at DataCamp, and I'm here today with Joe Harden. We just uh, re finished recording videos for her new course on statistical inference as part of our intro stat series. That's pretty exciting. Um, so welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's been fun. Good. Um, so Joe is a morning person. So we started at 6 a.m. this morning. Um, in so Boston. In, in Boston, Which is yes. 3 a.m. in California. Yep. And she's a trooper. She actually flew here uh, last night um, and then was up at um, 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. our time That's this right. morning. That's so, right. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so anyways, just wanted to ask a few questions of Joe uh, today to pick her brain a little bit while we have her here in the studio. Um, so the first thing I want to ask is you're a professor of math and stats. Um, how did you get into statistics? Did you start out as a mathematician and then find your way into stats the other way around? Um, and why stats? So my uh, undergraduate degree is in mathematics mostly because we didn't have a stat department. Um, I actually came to college thinking I wanted to be an actuary, which has some overlap in um, relation to statistics. But I fell in love with teaching, and I fell in love with college and, and the academy. So I thought to myself, how can I continue to do this for the rest of my life? And uh, statistics was a really natural fit. Um, I'd always been good at math. I really loved the applied problems that, that we were seeing. Uh, so I did a lot of statistics in undergrad, um, mm -hmm. even though I was a math major, and then I went on to get my graduate degree in statistics. Okay, cool. So um, what were some of the applications of stats that you were excited about that drew you to the field? Um, I actually did my senior thesis topic in 1995 in, on bootstrapping. Okay. So um, it, was a, it was a project that used... I don't even remember. I think it was like a logistic regression model. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did bootstrapping to uh, think about uh, confidence intervals for the coefficients and mm -hmm. the variability of the coefficients. And so the data was actually data that my, uh, my advisor had, had collaborators in the medical field. And so it was real mm -hmm. data and application to a real problem. OK, cool. So that's something I didn't even know about you. Um, and that's interesting because there, bootstrapping is a big part of the course that we just worked yeah, on together. Yeah, so something I've been doing for a long time, I've been thinking about for a long time. Okay. I understand it now a lot better than I did as a senior. Really? <laughs> in college, yes. Well, why? Well, part of it was that um, that we didn't have quite the technology that we that we do now. Sure. So, um, it was hard to simulate. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I was using S plus uh, as, a, as a student. The precursor to R. The precursor to R. Um, yeah that we had to pay for. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I did simulations and I was able to kind of generate the intervals and the variability that we needed, but the the way that, um, that R is written and the packages that have been created since that time make it a lot easier to sort of see what's going on, to visualize. The mm -hmm. graphics are so much better um, and just, just really, um, it, it takes away from the the work of having to code, mm -hmm. right? So it felt like a lot of weeds when I was a student that mm -hmm. we were just trying to get these technical details and yeah. um, less forest of just understanding the big concepts. It makes sense. So um, for people who don't know what bootstrapping is, you should take the course and you will know. Um, but maybe just give a quick explanation for somebody who's never been exposed to that before? So for lots of years, um, we as statisticians have been able to use theory to understand variability, so how samples vary from one to the next when you're taking samples from a population. So for example, polling uh, a population to understand uh, who's going to be the next president. That's right. That's right. So we understand, you know, how one sample proportion could vary over lots of samples when the population value is something different, right? Mm. Uh, and proportions is a great example because that's one we really understand with the theory. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of measures out there, ways that we summarize the data <clears throat> that don't have theory behind them mm -hmm. to understand how the samples could vary from one sample to the next mm -hmm. given a population. So for those statistics, um, you know, it might be the trimmed mean, where you're worried about extreme observations on one end or the other. You get some high, high, uh, some observations that are really high and some observations that are really low. Mm -hmm. The trimmed mean is much harder to say things about theoretically. Mm -hmm. um, so instead, what we do is we 
sample from the original data, from the original sample. And it turns out that this process of resampling from the original data is a great approximation for understanding the variability associated with a statistic that mm -hmm. uh, might not be the, the traditional statistics we work with. Mm -hmm. Sure. So for anybody who's maybe been through an intro stats course in the past, particularly for those people who had maybe a less than optimal experience going through intro stats in the past because they were taught to uh, memorize the right, formula right. for, Standard for example, <laughs> yeah, or T confidence interval. Yeah, right. The bootstrap is actually another way to think about confidence intervals, right? Right, right. Because um, it's that variability piece, and that's what right. a confidence interval you know, buys for you, it right. buys for you that variability. And, and ultimately it's about saying, um, we think that 55% um, of the population is going to vote for this president, um, but of course there's a lot of uncertainty in there, and, right. and so this is about trying to basically quantify how certain or uncertain we are about that, that figure. That's exactly right. Great. That's exactly um, right. Okay, cool. So let's focus in on the R piece for a second. Okay. Um, so this course is in R. Yep. Um, you mentioned that you used to work in S plus yeah, yeah. Um, some years ago. So maybe just describe, if you could, um, how you first came to um, to work with S plus and um, what the impact was for you. Yeah. So I used S plus as an undergraduate in the early '90s, which. Um, I don't think was particularly common, partly because you had to purchase it. Mm -hmm. um, at some point uh, before S Plus sort of went out of business, they did offer free educational um, licenses. But mm. um, <clears throat> then I went on and did my graduate work, and my graduate work had had um, simulation pieces to it, so I was using S Plus there as well. Uh, and then I started my job, my current job at Pomona College, and. Um, and when I started, I also had the institution buy S plus licenses. But um, when when we have students working with a licensed software, it gets complicated in terms of how do they get that software onto their own machines? How do they get um, you know how do they use the software after they leave the institution? Mm -hmm. All those kind of is the institution really ready to support it forever? All that kind of stuff. Um, so when R started becoming more viable in terms of the help files and the, the user interface, I immediately um, started using it in my classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I use R in all of my classes, so my intro stats to my, you know, even my theoretical classes, I'll mm -hmm. have them simulating things so that they kind of understand how the, how the theory is showing up. Um, and my students love it. I mean, they, they will write to me many years later and tell me they're using R in their job or mm -hmm. the, their fun activity. You know, they simulate, like, NBA pools and stuff yeah, <laughs> to figure, sure. figure stuff or, out. How likely am I win to win this poker hand? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, that, that's neat. So what, what do you think it is specifically, um, as, as an educator, about R or, or teaching, em empowering people to, to to be able to program things. What do you think it is about that that has such a positive impact for students? Um, I think that kind of like my experience as an undergraduate, um, R is really uh, set up to sort of answer questions. And so mm -hmm. when the students come and they're motivated and they're excited about solving a particular problem and understanding the mechanisms behind those problems, I think that, um, I think that R has just a, a really nice interface for, for the students to, to feel accomplished with mm -hmm. the problem that they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. um, but before you mentioned, like for you and your experience, like um, being able to like simulate things and, um, and, and actually visualize the yeah. output, like that, that had, a, had an impact right, on you. Right. It made right. abstract things, otherwise that's abstract right. things more concrete. That's right, that's yeah. right. And, and I, I agree, I think that's true for our students. I think that um, the graphics in R are outstanding and, mm -hmm. um, and pretty easy for the students to pick up quickly. Right. So, uh, so when they're, they're simulating to understand an abstract concept, that mm -hmm. visualization is important. Right. When, they're, um, when they're just making graphics of their own data, mm -hmm. that visualization is also important. Yeah, and I think it's, a, it's an important point because at the end of the day, R is a tool unless you're a, a developer and right. your focus is the programming itself, like um, R is a tool and when you're trying to teach stati statistics, you want everything else to kind of get out of the way. That's right, um, that's right. So that they can focus on the ideas that you're trying mm -hmm. to convey. 
um, and not how to program a for loop, right. for example. Right, right, um, right. Or, exactly. to, or to get some dots on a page. Right. Um, okay, very cool. Um, so why specifically, I think this is probably a pretty good segue, but why specifically did you want to um, build a course on statistical inference of all things? Um, well, I'm an educator, so mm -hmm. I teach at a small uh, residential college, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a lot of face-to-face -face interactions. Um, I see my students all the time. I get to know them really well. And that makes educating a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, I know what they understand. I know what they don't understand, um, and I can, I can address those needs. But I don't really feel like small liberal arts colleges, as fantastic as they are and as wonderful as I could just go on and on about. I don't know that they're the, the education of the future. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, I think a lot about where education will be in 20 years or 50 years. And um, certainly I believe that technology is gonna play a big role. Mm -hmm. And so one of the um, exciting things about coming to data camp for me was to see that other side mm -hmm. and to understand what is the process of building a course? How do you make choices about what to talk about and how to preempt the questions that the students might have? Because I'm not going to see their faces. I'm not going to know what's what's going on sort of behind the scenes. A much different medium. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And I'm not convinced that this is the medium that will exist in 50 years, but but I do think that, um, that things are changing and that technology will, will be important or will have a big role. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Um, so uh, maybe addressing those um, beginners out there, people who are just getting started with R and statistics, um, what advice would you have for them? So um, so my advice for, for my students, which I think um, is mostly, uh, they're, they're quite similar to the students on the Data Camp platform, um, is to just do a lot of statistics, do a lot of data analysis. Um, I tell my students, for example, to, you know, find some data somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's lots of good pa public databases and APIs and Kaggle competitions. Find some data and do an analysis. Come up with some cool graphics, put it on a blog, get a GitHub site. Mm -hmm. um, and if you really feel like you're not quite ready to, to be actually analyzing data, then do things like this. Mm -hmm. Take some classes. Think about, you know, read, read blogs like Simply Statistics or, mm -hmm. um, um, but but there but there are other other good blogs and mm. and uh, and just kind of tr keep trying things. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the best way to kind of think about whether it's right for you and how you can contribute to the yeah. field. Yeah, go make a bunch of mistakes and yeah, there very, you go. very publicly. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, Cool. Actually, so I, I want to go back to the last question. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious. So obviously, uh, we are actively trying to figure out what the future of education is yeah. as well. And I, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. It won't look the same today. Right. Whether it's Pomona or whether it's Data Camp. Right. It's not going to look the same today uh, uh, in 20 years right. as it does today. Right. Um, so I'm curious. If, no, neither of us have a crystal ball. Um, and we're trying to figure this out every single day. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. But mm -hmm. um, what do you think, it, maybe uh, broadly speaking, what are the characteristics of, um, of a successful educational system or educational process that you think we should be striving toward um, over the next 20 years? Like, what is missing today that you hope to see in the future that we could do better at? we in the collective? Well, okay, I mean, you know that I come from a particular perspective, so I'm gonna yeah. say the things That's from why my I brought perspective, you here. Yeah. <clears throat> which is that I actually believe that the liberal arts model is the best way to teach. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the the one-on-one -on -one interactions and the research projects that we do and the the class projects that the students do where I'm giving them, you know, really good feedback on every single paper mm -hmm. um, is invaluable. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't scale. That's mm -hmm. the problem with it. There's no possible way for it to scale. And whether we're talking about U.S. education or we're talking about internationally, mm -hmm. right, there's just um, a disconnect there. So, so I wonder how we can integrate that piece into it. And mm -hmm. I know that on some of the other online platforms, they do things like peer-to-peer um, -peer grading, peer-to-peer mm -hmm. -peer feedback. And I wonder if maybe that's a piece of it, is some kind of scaling of um, 
you know, communicating about ideas that are not fully formed or ideas that are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a huge uh, user of things like Stack Exchange, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's sort of that platform of getting good feedback. I mean, it's not always perfect, but yeah. getting getting good feedback quickly and often, yep. I think, uh, is pretty important. In a, in a way where other people can actually benefit from a response that right. was directed at your right. at you or right. the questions right. you had. My query. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think I think that's a great that's a great point, and. Um, yeah, I think realistically, it's it's going to be a combination of all of these things right. in the future. Right. There is no silver bullet when right. it comes to education. Technology has its place. Um, getting toe to toe with other human beings also has its right. place. That's right. Um, but it will be really exciting to see how things um, how things develop over the next mm -hmm. couple of decades. Because mm -hmm. I, I I absolutely agree with you. Things will be different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, cool. That's all I had. Uh, all right. So thanks to Thank Joe. Thank you. Um, and it's been really nice having you around. Yeah, it's been fun. All right. All right. Take care.